All right, let's get seats, everybody. Find seats. We get started. We got some good stuff tonight. We got a lot to cover. I want y'all to be able to get in cell groups, so it's not wasting time. If you didn't hear, I know some of y'all were upstairs. Uh, my wonderful wife made me a meat cake, and we're all going to get to share it, right? No. Uh, I've been on a, a no-keto diet, so she made me a meat cake, and she made all of you a cake. Isn't that awesome of her? Y'all give a big hand to Kat for doing that. That's going to be awesome. So what we're going to do is you go, when you go out, uh, there's going to be somebody cutting the cake for y'all and giving y'all a plate. Please take that with you uh, because of COVID and stuff. Don't want people to take off masks and stuff. Go outside, uh, take it in your car, get icing everywhere, make your parents mad. Um, it's not my problem, okay? But y'all y'all figure that out, all right? <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. It's going to be a great cake. If you've never had my wife's baked goods, mm. just enough to make me want to give up keto. All right, we're going to pray, and then we're going to get into the message here in a second. We're in our fifth week of Why God. In this series, we were saying Why God. And today, we're going to be uh, Why the Bible. I guess I was a little loud, the way y'all turned me down a little bit. Um, so let's bow our heads. We're going to pray, and we're going to get right into the message, okay? God, I come to you, and I'm just so grateful for you. And thankful for uh, the celebration of my birthday and just everyone uh, wishing me a blessed birthday, Lord. Um, but we are, we're so grateful for you that you sent our son, Lord, to die for us, Lord, and that you gave us your word to be changed and transformed by. So tonight, Lord, I pray that's the case, that we learn a lot about your word, that it is uh, something that can transform us and help us grow. And all these things I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. All right, don't let me forget. I'm going to say this now because I'm going to forget. Um, I want to exit groups one at a time when we leave, okay? I just don't want a huge clog right there. Please respect the mask, everybody. You know, I get it. No one loves it. You know, I don't like it. I'm sure no one loves wearing a mask. But it's a great way for us to respect each other and love one another. So uh, bear with us in that, okay? All right, so why the Bible? Here, I got a better question for you. And here's a question I want you to ponder tonight. Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you believe what you believe? Some of you would claim today that you, probably the majority of us, because it would make sense, we're in a Christian church today. Many of you come from Christian families. Uh, maybe you call Bethany your home. You'd probably say you believe in Christ. But why? Or maybe you say, no, I don't believe in that, or I'm not sure about it. Maybe you claim to be agnostic. Maybe you're atheist, and atheists hate it when you say, why do you believe what you believe? Because they don't believe anything. It's like, yeah, you do. You believe in that, right? Um, but, but truly, though, why do you believe what you believe? And this is a, a question I think is so, so important to your faith at your age, even to start asking this question now. Because I could promise you that your faith will not get you, your parents' faith will not get you into heaven. It has to be personal. It has to be your belief. You have to come to understand it. Now, you might say, how, am I, how do, can I come to understand this book? Man, there's so many things in here. People spend a lifetime trying to understand it. I get it. I get it. Right? But remember what Christ said. Christ said that a faith of a mustard seed can move mountains. And that little bit of faith you put in God, man, it could do incredible things. And it's going to grow and it's going to build. What is a mustard seed? You ever seen a mustard uh, tree? You might not know it if you saw it, but they're humongous. And that they're very, very tiny. But you might say, like, no, I, you know, all this is good. The Bible is great and everything, but I don't need that. I don't need that. I mean, it, it's an interesting book and stuff, but I don't like studying. I'm not a, a book kind of person. I used to make all those kind of excuses and, and I, maybe you say, I just know, all right, that God is real and that Jesus is real. I just feel it in my heart. There's a problem with that. The Bible says very clearly that the heart is deceitful among all things. Who could come to understand it? It's Jeremiah 17, 9. You, you cannot dare commit, uh, understand all your emotions and, and believe that your emotions are going to lead you correctly. I, I, I'm, I'm the same. I can't do this, right? I'm going to tell you, when I get angry, uh, things turn kind of red, right? And I'm just like, Hulk, you know, and I'm just like, I get mad, right? And I, I can't control myself when I'm angry. You know, anger is emotion, right? And what ends up happening when you get anger, things break, you know, sometimes. Sometimes you're, you might even be good at controlling your anger and maybe inward. But I don't know about you, when my anger takes hold afterwards, you know what happens is I regret sometimes the things or decisions I had, even the way I thought sometimes in that. 
So I don't think emotions are a great compass, if you would, to come to understand God's truth. And, and, I, and we've talked a lot about this blind faith. Anybody remember we talked about blind faith? And we talked about how, how you, blind faith can only get you so far. And actually, I don't even think blind, uh, blind faith is faith at all. It's false trust is what it is. But we have to have reason. We have to have understanding to believe what we believe. And that's where the Bible comes in. The Bible is an incredible, incredible book. Now, we're going to get into all different types of stuff. I'm going to be throwing passages at you and stuff. Um, I recommend notes if you can. But if not, that's okay. But hone in. There's going to be a little bit of a history lesson. I'm going to go fast. And I'm going to tell you, this is actually some really interesting things. Because if God is who he said he was, then his word is true. And if God is who he said he was, then he's going to show up all over the place throughout history. And I'm going to tell you, he does in some amazing ways. But let's, let's take a step back from that for a second. I want to give you something else. The Bible affirms itself. Now, because many people will say, you know what? I, I just can't buy this whole Christianity thing. It's like a fairy tale. It's just like, you know, this weird story and stuff. Guys getting eaten by wells and, you know, um, Jesus or God coming down in like a tornado and all these different things and Jesus healing the blind. That, I just don't buy it. Maybe somebody will tell you that because, and what are they doing? They're trusting their emotion. Or maybe they're going way too literal and they're like, I've never seen anything like that. So therefore it can't exist show me the money kind of person, right? You know anybody like that? Maybe you're like that, right? And, or maybe there's uh, even even some of you out there today, he's like, you know what? Um, it's a great story, but at the end of the day, I don't know. Some of the things in the Bible are great, and some of them aren't. Did you know this? One of our founding fathers, he took the Bible, founding fathers of America, he took the Bible, and he, and he tediously cut out sections of the Bible he didn't like. Most of the ones he didn't like were words that weren't uttered by Jesus. And, and by the end, he just had this kind of scrapbook-looking Bible. And you could actually, go, I've seen it myself, in the Smithsonian, you could go and see this. And he called that uh, the, the dung hills of the Bible. All the things that he didn't like. He called those the dung hills of the Bible, and he read only the things he liked. Anybody know who the found leaders don't help? Any of the leading any uh, anybody who's not a leader know who that is? Very good, very good. Thomas Jefferson. Can you believe that? What are our founding fathers did that? So he, here's the here's the thing. Is that okay? Is it okay to say, you know what, I I like this because it makes me feel this way, but I don't like that. I, I think the Bible itself speaks against that type of understanding. And, and I think there's, this is seriously things to think about, right? And, and by the end of this, I, well, this is what I hope you could do and, and answer for yourself. Can I believe in Jesus without believing in the Bible? Now, some of you are probably saying no, but I'm going to tell you the majority of people today, they struggle with that. They struggle with that. And it's okay to struggle with it. It's okay to say, like, I don't know. I'm not sure. But I want you to wrestle through it. Don't just kind of have this sticking in your heart and being like, I don't know about all this. Work it out. Some of you are 12. Some of you are all the way to 18 years old. You know, that's not a big span. Some of you may be 11. That's not a large span. That's like seven years. Seven years between that. And I don't expect you to know everything. But I expect you to be on a journey to discover God's good news through his good word and his good truths. So here's, a, here's some verses right here that are just amazing to me that are self-affirming, right? Here's the first one, Matthew 4.4. 4. It says, but he answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. But what does it say there? But every word that comes from the mouth of God. Every word. I wonder if Thomas Jefferson cut that one out. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Wow, that's encouraging, right? Imagine if you thought of the Bible as a flashlight. Where am I going, God? Um, God, I need to know this. And it's not like ding, 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 ding. Oh, no, no, right here. Ding, 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 ding. You know, it's not like that. But it's like, okay, God, you have direction for me. And sometimes it could be hard. That's going to take counsel and God's word. It's not going to, you're not going to turn to a page and say, Billy Heston, you're going to eat a meat cake today. It's going to be awesome. It's not going to say anything like that. 
But remember, the Bible is not about us. It's about God. For us to know God and know directions about him. It goes on. It says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, and, and for training in righteousness that man, uh, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, what does it say again there at the beginning? It says, all scripture. I'm going to tell you, me and um, my men's group that meets on Friday, we were laughing about some really weird verses in the Bible. And, and you could take things out of context very much so. So it's what those words mean. And understanding what God was doing in that context. But it's still all good for training, for all those things. And I loved at the end there, it says, equipped for every good work. God wants you to be equipped for what he's doing in the world. He wants you to be strong and courageous in it. It goes on, sanctify, which is being made like God. Sanctified. So being made like a saint. It says, sanctify them in the truth. What does it say? Your word is truth. Now, isn't it interesting that it doesn't say, you know what, the Old Testament, eh, that's kind of iffy. But this over here, that's truth. No, it says, the word is truth. Your word is truth. Goes on, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. That's powerful to think about. You know, you can get to heaven and you'd be like, whew, I made it. I read like half the Bible, right? But I'm good now. We don't need it, right, Any, anymore, God? No. It's good for all eternity. And, and we're going to be reading this and we're going to be encouraged by it for all eternity. That shouldn't overwhelm us. That should excite us. It should even more excite us that we have something that we can hold that's eternal, that goes beyond time. That's really, really crazy. I'm going to tell you a story. When I was uh, right at the uh, beginning of my youth pastor career, about three years in, I had a young man that I, I saw all the time. He was a waiter, waiter at Chili's, and... Um, and he was just this charismatic young man. And right away, I was like, I wonder if this guy knows Jesus. And some of my teenagers knew him. And I said, hey, what do you know about this kid named Andrew? And they were like, well, I know he's an atheist. And I was like, oh, interesting. What do you think about talking to him about Jesus? And they're like, that's a really bad idea. That's a really bad idea. Don't do that. He, he just slams Christians back and forth. And back in my arrogant at time back then, I was like, challenge accepted, right? And uh, we started a Facebook message back and forth for some time. And uh, he was. He was angry to Christians. And he said all kinds of things to me. Um, one of them that I thought cracked me up, you know, back then. He told me that presidents can't uh, be atheists. He's like, there's a law on books that uh, presidents have to be Christians. I was like, there's no such thing in writing. And that was just kind of some silly stuff like that. But one of the ones that was really interesting to me, he said the Bible was only written somewhere between 600 and 400 years ago. I was like, what? He said, yeah, some guy made it up, King James or something. And I was like, dude, there's, there's no proof to that. There's not, not even, I mean, it's the exact opposite. Like, you can literally, you can go to places like the Smithsonian's. You can go to libraries that have books. Bibles that are older than that. And in fact, I want to tell you about some interesting ones, right? You ever heard of the printing press? Anybody ever heard of him? Gu uh, Gutenberg, Gutenberg's printing press is something you should have learned at school, hopefully. Um, and it happened in 1440 AD, somewhere around in there. And, and what happened was Gutenberg, um, this is something you might not know. What did Gutenberg actually print first? The Bible, right? Uh, the Bible he printed, uh, he only printed 180 of these. There's only 49 known in existence today. And, and, and if you had one of these, how much do you think it'd be worth if you had to guess? How much? Two million. All right, let's flip the, flip the thing here. If you had one, it would be $35 million approximately if you own one today. Isn't that crazy? Man, God's word is valuable, right? But this guy, he had a vision of saying, like, you know what, God's word is important. But, hey, this was, if, if that's when it started, right? A lot of you think, like, man, that's when it started. That's when God's word was more accessible. No. Before that, you know what they did before there was a printing press? They would write it by hand. 
they would painstakingly look at this, and sometimes it would be in different languages, and they would write it by hand in that. And it was a team effort. There'd be uh, like 12 guys, and there would be four guys that would constantly look over their shoulders and tell them no. Can you imagine doing a whole page, and they're like, oh, you screwed up right there. Oh, <laughs> who wants that job, right? But this is, this is what happened. And for hundreds and hundreds, even a thousand years, more than a thousand years, that's how it was done. Passed down one little bit at a time. But, but here's what I told my friend Andrew is I told him, I said, I said, man, the oldest Bible that we have that's complete is actually, in, was written in 300 AD. It was written by this guy named Jerome. Now, Jerome looks like a weird dude. I mean, he just looks weird, right? He looks angry about something, right? And he was angry. He was angry at the Catholic Church. He really was. Because he spent all, a long, long time. And what he did was he took, and before the Bible was written in any language, the original languages, there was three of them, and we'll talk about that in a second. But he took those three languages and all these old manuscripts that barely anybody knew how to read, and he studied them crazy hard. And he put it in one volume, and it's the Latin Bible. And he, he gave it to the Catholic Church, and he's like, here, distribute this. This is, this is what I feel God has called me to do, is to put God's Word in every single person's hands. And you know what the church said? Oh, no, 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 no. This is a holy book. And we need to, we need to protect it, right? And, and, and they didn't distribute it. And Jerome was ticked. He was so mad. He said, not only should it not stay in Latin, it should be in every language possible. This was in 380 AD. But the problem was people didn't know how to read. People didn't know how to write. Uh, the, the average person didn't even know how to do those things. Didn't even know how to read. Until the printing press came around and changed that dramatically. God knew that. And God was still using people like Jerome and many other church fathers during that time. But here's the most important thing. And I know y'all might be, this is boring. This is a history lesson. But this is incredible. And I told you that God shows up in history. Get this. You can look at it. Scholars looked at the Vulgate today. And they looked at every, every translation that he did into Latin. And it's considered 99.9% .9 accurate to the translation. That is literally impossible to do. It takes a team of scholars to do that today when they transfer it into a language. And he did it in the original language. It's only, honestly, my, my thought is that is only capable through God. And I believe God used men like him and many others. Talgate, you just look them up. There's so many. Martin Luther, all these people who God used throughout history and showed up many times to get his word in people's hands. Get his word in people's hands. I know what you may be thinking, though. You might be thinking, you know what, Billy? The Bible, though, you're giving all this inside information. All this inside information. Well, let's step back. Let's look at the Bible at 10,000 feet and ponder this in. The Bible is made up of 40 different authors. It had 40 different authors. Over a span of 1,500 years. So many of these authors didn't even know each other. None of them, they didn't even talk to each other. Like, hey, what'd you write and stuff? They would have to read that other person's writing. But, but many times that would be really hard. Remember, they didn't have a printing press. They'd have to tra travel hundreds of miles just to read one section of the Bible. And so approximately 1,500 years by 40 different authors. I wrote that twice, my bad. And in, in 15 different countries. So very big span of place. Remember I said it was three different original languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Kone Greek. And yet there is not a single provable contradiction in the entire Bible. That is unfathomable. That is something that only God can do. It's impossible for man to do this. Impossible. You, you keep going, right? And many people will say, but like, how do we know that that was actually what God wrote? Well, again, they passed these things down. And remember, if you touched paper, um, what would happen to paper over time? The acids on our skin would deteriorate. If I took this piece of paper and I tried to keep it for thousands of years, it would just crumble and fall apart like dust. Sometimes they used uh, cattle skin. Sometimes they used different plants. They tried everything they can, and we do have fragments of those things. But I want to do a comparison real quick. Listen to this. This is nuts. 
There's 5,800 complete Greek fragments, manuscripts of the Bible. There's 10,000 Latin manuscripts. And there are 9,300 manuscripts of other ancient writings of the Bible. That means like, okay, whatever. This, you're talking about crazy long time ago, Billy. All right, I want to compare this to any other ancient writing. Any other ancient writing. Let's compare this real quick. Get this. Anybody ever heard of this guy, Plato? Not the thing you play with? Plato. Raise a hand if you've ever heard of Plato the philosopher. You should be learning about this guy in school. Unquestionable that he existed at some point, right? A philosopher. I mean, and they had some amazing thoughts, right? Some of them, I would say, even comparable to the Bible. Some of the philosophies that are in there. And Plato, he lived uh, way before Christ, about 400 years before Christ. And get this, he had, there's only 210 manuscripts of all of his writings. The closest one to his life was 1,200 years after he lived. 1,200 years. So what they did, remember, they would write it down and they'd pass it down and another guy would copy it. And they'd write it down and they'd pass it down and another guy would copy it. And they don't even come that close to when he lived. In fact, there's manuscripts of Jesus, of what Jesus said, that date 25 years after he lived. And we actually have writings of him. That's insane. That's insane to think about. Let's use another one. A good friend of Plato was Aristotle. Aristotle was actually more popular than Plato. There are only five manuscripts of Plato that exist. Five. And the closest one to when he lived was 1,400 years after he lived. So comparable. Here, here's when I ask you, next time your history teacher, teacher asks you about these guys, and honestly, I enjoy reading these, these guys. I think they had some interesting ideas. But let me, let me ask you, do you think anybody debates whether or not Plato or Aristotle lived? Not a single scholar would even dare. But yet when it comes to Jesus and the amount of, of evidence. And get this. Jesus was a nobody comparative to his time. I mean, he, he wasn't a king. He wasn't this great philosopher. He was a carpenter's son. Right? He walked around homeless. And yet he changed the entire world. If that doesn't get you stirred, if that doesn't get you thinking like, whoa, something's going on here. Let me tell you, that's sad. Because it is remarkable. I want to I want to give you a few more real quick passages here before we go to cell groups. But I want you to think about this. If God's word is truly from God, how important is it? If you were created for a purpose, which I think is unquestionable, I don't if you believe that we're here by random chance, we're just this uh, dirt rolled, rolling around the sun, <laughs> and we're just here by random chance, and everything you see is by random chance, you know what I tell you? You have incredible faith. You have incredible faith. Because comparative to what God's word can do, and what I have actually seen it transform lives. Reading the word every day statistically is shown to help people with all kinds of addictions, help people with depression, anxiety. Reading the Bible every day is, is an incredible thing, but you can't just read it. You have to apply it. You have to take it in. You have to let it change you. Hebrews 4, 12 is a great example of this. It says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Everybody hold, hold up. If you have your Bible, you can hold it up, right? We've already talked about this being a light to our feet, right? Act like you're holding, holding a Bible, right? Imagine this being a sword. It's a weapon, right? Sharper than any uh, two-edged sword. Piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts of, and, and intentions of the heart. Remember when I said the heart is deceitful? How do you, how do you kind of start questioning the heart and the motive of the heart? It says it right there, God's word. So, but here's the thing. Weapons are dangerous. Would you agree? They're dangerous. People have used weapons to do horrible things throughout history. So is that what this is for? Let me tell you, people have. People have used this weapon to hurt people and manipulate people. I could promise you that was never God's intent. Because this was to come and give life and life abundantly. So who is this? 
Who's his weapon towards? Let's read the next verse. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The word that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. It's not some magic potion. You're not going to just read it and it's going to be ding. I get it. But this can change your life. But you have to want it. You have to say, God, show me. Help me discern your truths and let them change me from within. That flesh, all right, I know this is kind of gross. I'm a, I'm a hunter. I like meat and stuff, as Kat said and stuff. But what are, swords, right? You're carving. Whose flesh are you carving off? It's your own. And that's, uh, many people look at other people and they say, hey, you got something right there. Let me get that off for you. And they're hunking things off of people. It's not how it's meant to be. Remember what it says. Get the plank out of your own eye before you take the stick out of your brother's. So this should be a mirror. We have a light, we have a sword, and we have a mirror. It's something that we look in and we, we say, within, this is something I need to work on, God. And let my life be an example to someone else so they don't make the same mistake as I do. What a powerful weapon. It goes on. Last, last one. Because here's the thing. You might be thinking tonight, you might be thinking tonight, Billy, you know, this is great and everything, but and I want that kind of life. But I don't even know where to start. I challenge you, one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible is Romans 10. It's just so simple and easy. It's pretty direct even in a lot of ways. But there's a passage in there that I think really brings all this home. It says Romans 10, 17. It says, so faith comes from hearing. What does it say there? Hearing through the word of Christ. You want to have faith. You want to come to trust God. You got to open your Bible. And you got to look for Jesus. The first week we talked here, we said Jesus is what? What was he doing at the door? He's knocking. He wants to come in. He wants to dine with you. He wants to live with you. But maybe it's cracking this open for once. Not making excuses. Let me tell you, this is kind of embarrassing, right? Last thing. When I was in sixth grade, I suffered from dyslexia. I still do in my life. Come a long ways with that. And I struggled. I struggled reading. Um, I struggled all through school. In sixth grade, I was a very, very poor, poor reader. Sixth grade. So some of you are in sixth grade. And, and I remember I was just so embarrassed by that. But this book, right around that same age, 12 years old, came into my life. And I started to just carve away at it and try and chip away at it and try and chip away at it. And I'm going to promise you through someone who's lived through it and many of your leaders, it has the power to change your life. It didn't give me magic powers to learn how to read better, but it did help me and encourage me to know that this is a way. And still to this day, I, I learn way more audibly and visually, and I use those tools. You should use those tools too. In the generation you live in, you have absolutely no excuse to learn the truths of God. Now it's hard, don't get me wrong. Because remember, I said a lot of people are using this for a really bad weapon. And you have to be discerning in that. But you're not alone. Look to your leaders. Look to these people who want to encourage you. And just try. Just try. Let me, bow, let me ask you about your heads. We're going to pray. As you, as you have your heads bowed, I want to ask you one last question. Remember I said, why do you believe what you believe? Do you believe God's word? Can you really say that you believe in Jesus without believing in his word? He is the word of God. If you've never come to put trust in him, don't wait. Maybe that mustard seed will start growing. God, I come to you thankful for these people, these young people, and even their leaders, Lord, to be here today. Lord, to hear this truth, Lord, this amazing truth that you have passed down your word through multiple people and through way different kinds of means that we ever can imagine possible. And it's something done by spirit. So Lord, we invite you in spirit, which is your word, to be guided by it and be guided by your truths. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.